We are drawing ever closer to BYU kicking off spring ball next Monday. What does the running back position have to prove, especially with two of their expected contributors not in camp? We'll talk about that, and we'll also continue to look at what's going on with the Big 12 and the Pac-12. What is ION? Let's explain. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Appreciate you guys taking the time, as always, to join us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. The motto is your team every day, and as such, we are your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Uh, some of you have asked me, well, what, what's your background, Jake? I actually work for a radio station in Salt Lake City. For those of you who are unaware, I work for the KSL Sports Zone, and I am the executive producer of DJ and PK in the morning and luckily enough i've been doing a uh, radio and full-time sports media stuff for 12 years at this point in my career and it's just a ton of fun to do and let's dive right in on today's show and obviously something i have done the majority of my career covering byu is get out to spring ball and i absolutely love spring ball i have like this sick uh, i guess fascination with it because i know in my heart of hearts that most everything i'm going to see during spring ball in terms of overall plays made guys standing out uh, during those sessions very few of them are going to translate to training camp in august but there is still something about spring ball and the hype machine that comes with this time of year i think it might just be simply due to the fact that we are so starved for football by the time it rolls around that we're willing to latch on to anything i include myself in this conversation by the way and what i've been doing this week and what we did yesterday and we'll continue this right now is we're going through these burning questions for byu going into spring ball and today's one pertains to to the running back position. Now, the reason I bring that up is because BYU, I think all of us, yours truly included, expects the Aiden Robbins, the UNLV transfer to BYU, to be BYU's lead back this coming fall. Now, Aiden Robbins will not be participating in spring ball because he announced on social media, it's over a month ago now, I believe, that he is having a wrist surgery and will be cleared in time for training camp, but will be held out of spring ball and will not be participating in drills. So getting a chance to see him actually suited up in BYU pads and a helmet, et cetera, is not going to happen in the spring. It's going to have to wait until training camp. Also, LJ Martin, the four-star running back or high three-star running back, depending on which recruiting service you happen to favor, he will not be enrolling until the summer for BYU. So two of the guys, potentially the top two guys, by the way, that BYU has in the running back stable in theory this coming season will not be participating in spring ball. And that opens up opportunities for guys currently on the roster. And I, I think at times I've been guilty of this, and I think many of us out there have been guilty of this, is that it, it can be very easy to discount guys currently on the roster who have not really showed out and expect that the guys are going to come in like an Aiden Robbins who had a 1,000-yard season last year at UNLV and is expected to be the guy that you're like, this counting everybody else. The thing about this, though, this opens up an opportunity this spring for both Hinkley Ropati and Miles Davis, among others, to go out and make an impression with this BYU staff. Now, Aaron Roderick, the running backs coach, uh, Harvey Unga, they will be very aware of what Hinkley Ropati and Miles Davis bring to the table because they have been in the program for a number of seasons now. The biggest thing they can do, speaking of both Hinkley and Miles, is go out there during spring ball and show that they can truly be one of those top backs, maybe the guy for BYU in the running back position. Now, that obviously will be carrying over to training camp and have to beat out a guy like Aiden Robbins and or LJ Martin once they're actually available to practice. But this spring is going to be very very important, especially for a guy like Hinkley Ropati, is what we saw towards the tail end of last season when he really started to break out for BYU. Was that a flash in the pan, or is that something you can build on as a staff? In Miles Davis' case, can he officially kick the injury bug? He has been a guy, and Hinkley has no exception to this, who have both had injuries during their time at BYU. They've got to prove to be guys that can be reliable and be counted upon to get out there on the football field. Other guys who will be looking at the spring ball, hopefully to getting an opportunity, is guys like Mason Fakahua. Uh, he's got great size, 6'2", 230 pounds. Actually plays more like a fullback in some ways, in my mind. Can he show out? Is a guy like Enoch Nawahine, the transfer from a U USU, Utah State, who walked on with BYU, is he capable of making a, a move up the depth chart? And then also, the status for Jax McChesney. Now, I, I've 
I've been tracking Jackson's status, been talking with people, and it's just it's a we'll see what happens. I'm excited to finally see that spring roster and see if Jackson's name is on there. He is a guy that's been full of potential, but injuries just absolutely derailed his career at BYU. When he's been on the field, if you remember that, he had the freshman rushing record at UMass. He came in and absolutely steamrolled guys in that Navy game in 2020. He had the big game in the final stanza against USC in 2021. He has had his moments in a BYU uniform, but every time it seems like he has one of those moments, he gets injured. And that's the, that's the problem for a guy like Jackson McChesney. And hopefully if he's sticking around with the program, like I said, I don't have clarification on that. He can use this spring period to show what he's capable of doing. But the bigger thing is the top two guys in spring ball are going to be Hinkley Ropati and Miles Davis. They have got the opportunity to go out and really assert themselves atop the depth chart coming out of spring ball. Will that mean that they are the guy, the number one guy going into training camp? No guarantees there because, like I said, when you add two guys like Aiden Robbins and obviously LJ Martin, the caliber of both of those guys, mean it's going to be an absolute dog fight in training camp, but they have got to show both Hinkley and Miles this fall, I mean, this spring, excuse me, that they can go out there and be guys who can be difference makers in this offense. How much live action they'll actually get was TBD, etc., but there is an opportunity on the table for them to show what they also are capable of doing. Now, one other name I have not mentioned quite yet that I'm excited to finally see him on the field is Nukuluve Halu. Nukuluve Halu is a guy who's got all the size, all the ability, but we've just not seen him in a BYU uniform yet. He is a uh, mid-year enrollee enrolled in the winter will be a part of the program this spring how much can he show as a true freshman a guy coming home off of a mission for the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and then get out there and show what he's capable of doing we're going to find out he's been working hard based on everything i have seen slash heard about him but how much will he ultimately be given the green light to really show what he's capable of doing only time will tell. But the nice part is there is depth of that running back position. The bigger question will be this spring. How much can these guys make an impression? And how much, like I said, of that will truly transfer over to fall and August when train camp begins? Only time will tell. But, hey, it's spring. It's time to talk about our spring all-stars as I like to talk about them. And like I said, I'm as geeked as anybody for it to begin next Monday. All right, coming up next, a couple of you asked me to weigh in on the ION situation in the Pac-12. We also got some news out of the Northwest with Oregon State's president making a radio appearance. We'll talk about all that information here in just a moment. First, a word on our friends over at Built Bar. Now, I've been talking about Built Bars forever, my friends. The best part is if you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, Built Bars are the option for you. The incredible part about Built Bars is they're incredibly delicious. And I, I mean this sincerely. I, I'm not blowing smoke up your skirt. I, I absolutely love Built Bars. You got to try them. With Built Healthy is actually tasty. They're covered in 100% chocolate. They're soft and easy to chew. The best part is they got a bevy of different flavors. I bet you can find one, two, or I feel like 10 that'll fit your flavor profile that you will absolutely love love. You just have to go online and place your order and wait for them to be shipped to your home. You don't have to do that any longer. You actually can stop by your local Smith's today or your local Sam's Club and pick them up. They've got four bar packs available now at Smith's. If you want to stop by there, pick those up. Or if you like me and you like to buy in bulk, get to your local Sam's Club and get a 13 bar pack available to you now. But once again, if you don't mind waiting, you can go to built.com, place your order there. And while you're there, use the promo code locked on 15 for 15% off your order. You can't get that discount in store, but you can do it online. Once again, that's built.com. Com, promo code locked on 15 or stop by your local Smiths and or Sam's Club today. That's Built Bar, the best tasting protein bars ever. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at Perry Homes. Whether you're looking for your first home or you're ready to upgrade to your dream home, Perry Homes has a house for you. For 50 years, Perry Homes has been Utah's premier home builder with communities throughout the state. They have many communities, home designs, and price points to help meet your needs, my friends. They've got beautiful communities in both, and why well, it's not both, but all of Davis, Salt Lake, Tooele, Utah counties, and multiple communities in Washington County near St. George. So no matter where you want to live here in Utah, they've probably got an option for you. Perry Homes offers over 50 unique home designs from Ramblers to two stories of townhomes. They even have quick move-in homes available now if you're ready to move right away. The best part is they also offer generous financing incentives for their preferred lenders. So visit PerryHomesUtah.com to see what's new, new in Utah's finest neighborhoods. That's PerryHomesUtah.com. For 50 years, Utah has been coming home to Perry Homes. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day, my friends. Make sure you check out Locked On College Basketball. It's your way to get ready for March Madness. All the news and intel you need to know about the college basketball scene. You'll hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players alike. Get that free and available wherever you get your podcast. That's Locked On College Basketball on YouTube or your various podcast providers. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff you guys want to talk about. Now, <clears throat> 
two uh, questions that have kind of stuck with this podcast over the last little bit are with regards to BYU strength and conditioning and also what's going on with the Big 12 and the Pac-12. Let's start off with the Big 12 versus Pac-12 debate right now. Now, uh, obviously, over the weekend, or it was, I think it was Friday, the report came out mid-morning that Brett McMurphy reported that Ion Networks was uh, in conversations with the Pac-12. And uh, if you did not know what Ion is or you still don't know what Ion is, don't feel like you're alone. I had no clue what it was until I Googled it. Ion is a network that has been around for the better part of, I think I think it's like 40 some odd years, but they have recently opened up a sports division. Scripps uh, Entertainment, uh, if you know that uh, conglomerate out there, they own uh, uh, this uh, network, Ion Network. And the thing about it is it is available in some markets on over-the-air TV. For example, here in the state of Utah, it's officially Channel 16, KUPX, I believe are the call uh, signal for uh, Ion Network. Now, if you go to Ion Network, you're likely to see a rerun of Hawaii Five O. 0 uh, Scrubs might be on there. Who knows? MASH. Matlock. I, I don't know what's going to be on it, but it, essentially this is a network that is doing a lot of the, uh, what do you call them? Syndicated television. And they do like uh, runs of like uh, series seasons of them. I, I, what do you call it? Uh, marathon sessions. So that's the inter- interesting part about this is if Ion is serious about this and the PAC 12 is serious about engaging with them, what are you doing? Because no offense to the Pac-12, but the more stuff like this leaks out, and I know that Stuart Mandel, who lives out in the Bay Area, tried to refute the report saying that contrary to reports, there has been no contact between ION and the Pac-12. To me, this is just my conspiracy theory, and I'm not the only one who shares this. I think that ION and the Pac-12 did have some conversations, and it may have been leaked out to a guy like Brett McMurphy just to see what the reaction was publicly to see if, okay, Pac-12 fans, if they're okay with that. And obviously, the backlash was tremendous. It absolutely backfired. And uh, I'm guessing that that report from uh, Stuart Mandel came out shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter refuting it was when they're like, oh, okay, this isn't landing with anybody. Hey, uh, Stu, uh, you can put out that we did not have that conversation. And you can have as simple as one conversation and that constitutes contact between the Pac-12 and this network. Now, the interesting part about this is earlier uh, today, I'm recording this on Monday night, uh, just as a heads up for you guys. Uh, Jason Shear, uh, I saw him tweet this out, but on John Canzano's radio net, uh, radio show up in Oregon, uh, Jayathi Murthy, who is the new president of Oregon State University, was John, on John Canzano's podcast. And in the conversation, there were two pertinent things that I took away from it. Uh, Oregon State presidents mentioned that there have had discussions about unequal revenue sharing that to me screams that the pac-12 is worried about both oregon and washington trying to get away maybe make the jump to the big 10 etc and i'm trying to appease them by saying hey we're willing to give you guys a bigger share of the revenue pie here if you'll stick around sign a grant of rights and stick with us the other thing about this is is uh that if you kind of uh listen to the interview she insinuated that there's not necessarily uh, i think a firm offer on the table for the pac-12 right now and that's got to be concerning dennis dodd came on my radio show dj and pk this goes back almost a month ago and he said that there was a it's about a 14 months or no it wasn't 14 months at that point it was like 18 months or some such uh till the pac 12s media rights were done like the the contract was up and he said in relative terms this is coming down to the wire the pac 12 should have had this done and the bigger thing is he also added this that the big 12 swooped in and kind of took the spot that the the, the pac 12 did and good on the big 12 let me be very clear about this the big 12 and brett yormark did exactly what they should have done i've said this once before but i was listening to andy staples podcast uh on the athletic he does a great job and he talked about the the this is uh the pac-12 and the big 12 essentially are like a three-star linebacker middle of the road not necessarily the high-end athlete but both of them are being recruited or were being recruited by the same school in, in this theory so essentially the school are the tv networks and essentially the tv networks or the school had one scholarship for these two players. The first one to accept it got the spot, and the Big 12 was that three-star linebacker. He said, well, take what you've given us. We're good to go. The Pac-12 tried to come back around and grab that, and they're like, well, there's no room for you now. And now you're having to scramble, uh, speaking of the Pac-12, to figure things out. So this is a very, very tenuous situation for the Pac-12 to be in. Uh, and I, I've i got good friends who are big Utah fans. I've actually got a, a really, really dear friend who is a massive, and I mean massive, Arizona State fan. Grew up down there in the Valley. I'm not talking Talking about PK, let me be very clear about that. But I have a very good friend who's an ASU fan, and we had a conversation just a while back, and topic turned to, okay, what, what do you feel about this? And he's just, he's frustrated beyond belief. He's like, dude, 
I just simply want to know where I can watch the Sun Devils play. And I said, well, you want to get them over in the Big 12? He said, if the worst comes to worse, there are worse places to be. At least the Big 12 is, has their deal done. At least they're locked in. And we know that with some certainty what the Big 12 is doing. The situation with the Pac-12 is there's just so much unknown right now. It was interesting to hear Jathy Murthy once again speaking with John Canzano and kind of insinuate, I was just kind of reading between the lines, that they, they don't necessarily, I think, have an offer on the table right now that they could say, hey, we'll take that and move on with it. And they may very well be leaking out, okay, what about this ION network thing? They're looking at all options. I think they're still pegging or hoping that uh, uh, Apple, uh, Amazon will come to the rescue and hopefully help them out. And who knows? Maybe they will. And maybe they'll pull a rabbit out of their hat. George Klyovkov will pull will pull something crazy and get a number that is absolutely incredible. But right now, in many ways, just kind of reading the tea leaves out there, the Pac-12 is in deep doo-doo right now. And I think all of the parties in there trying to put on a brave face and say that we're we're working together. They had that whole thing about we're consummating a deal soon. We're going to or we are going to consummate a deal in the relatively near future. Yeah, they very well may consummate that deal. The bigger question will be how much money will there be in that deal on an annual basis? Will there be that unequal revenue sharing going on for programs like an Oregon, like a Washington, maybe in theory, like a program like Utah asserts itself saying that we we've won the conference the last two years. We deserve a bigger share. Regardless, that's all going to have to be worked out and resolved. And it's got to be resolved and worked out. It feels like in the next two to three months to really uh, in some ways save face and hopefully keep this conference together. We'll find out. It's a very, very interesting sign uh, sign of the times for the big, for the Pac-12 right now. But let me just reiterate one thing about the Big 12 and BYU's place there. Thank your lucky stars that you're A, in the Power 5. B, you have yourself locked in for the next five to seven to ten years in theory for BYU in the Big 12. And the nice part is you can kind of sit back now and let th let the chips fall where they may because you have your spot locked up. Now, some of you will probably say, well, we don't want Utah. Let's say, let's say the Pac-12 blows up and we don't want Utah in the, in the Big 12. That's great. You, you can have that. You can have that opinion. But I'm of the opinion that getting Utah into the Big 12 with BYU makes it one of the top rivalries that will be featured right away. And just it, it just makes that rivalry all that much more fun. It goes probably back to being played on Thanksgiving weekend. I'm an advocate for it. Now, I, I, that may I make you make your blood boil to have me say that, but I do think it would be a net positive uh, for the conference if a program like Utah were willing to do that. Now, I've also had some conversations with some folks that are more connected to Utah than I am, and I got to say this. Utah really thinks highly of themselves, and that may ultimately prove to be their undoing. I mean, just I'll just trust me on that. They, they, they think that they are – Pretty hot stuff. They think they are a 10 when maybe they're more of like a six or a seven. But hey, time will tell what ultimately is going to play out here. Now, coming up here in just a minute, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, with BYU baseball. They're supposed to play today, but that game has been canceled. Will it be, re will it be, um, what am I trying to say? Will, will it be rescheduled? We'll get to that. I also did not address with regards to the strength and conditioning staff. Some of you asked me in the YouTube comments about to clarify that. I've clarified it a few times before, but we'll clarify it once again. We'll get to all of that in just a couple of moments. First, a word on our friends over at UCCU. At UCCU, CCU Love Warrior Bank is a promise, my friends, made by a local not-for-profit financial institution that is dedicated to helping families improve their financial lives. UCCU delivers on that promise. They pioneer new technologies to make banking safer, easier, and more convenient. They create new products and services that add real value to their members, and they provide easy access to real local human beings who always give the personal help or assistance they can muster. There are many reasons to love banking at UCCU, and I can attest to this because I have been a UCCU customer for 30 years now. The best part is as simple as visiting uccu.com to get started or stop it by any branch, both in Utah County and now also in Salt Lake County here in Utah if you want to get started there. The best part is there's not testimonials just from me. There's also one from our good friend Floyd from Nephi. He says, UCCU is the best of what a, and what a banking institution should be about. They actually care about their members and go above and beyond to get you what you really need. They are the best. Uh, I'll just echo amen to Floyd. They are the best. I would encourage you guys to get started with them now. That's UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Always appreciate you guys checking out the show and being a part of it. It just, it means the world to me. You guys take the time out of your day. Thousands of you both in the regular podcast form. Wow. Didn't have my, didn't have my voice, voice break there. 
uh, thousands of you uh, checking us on the regular podcast side of things. And also there are thousands of you on YouTube. It's been absolutely incredible. We're coming up on just, uh, we're just over a month away from celebrating our one year anniversary of BYU at Locked On Cougars being on YouTube. So looking forward to celebrating that here in about a month's time. But a couple of things before we go on today's show. Some of you asked in the YouTube comments, what's going on with strength and conditioning, Jake? Well, they did uh, fire the top two strength and conditioning coaches. New Tafisi and Justin McClure are out at BYU. And they have not made a formal announcement about their staff, but we had Chad Lewis, the former BYU and Philadelphia Eagles tight end, on with DJ and PK in the lead up to the uh, Super Bowl. And he talked about how BYU is kind of going about things, some things differently in their football program. He mentioned that Spencer Reed, who is actually the son of B- of Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reed, is now running BYU's essentially day-to-day operations inside the weight room. So for lack of a better term, Spencer Reed is your director of conditioning, strength and conditioning, whatever it is. But there is uh, there is also a sports science department being led by Dr. Skyler Maine. Many of you probably might know his name. Very, very uh, fun dude. He's got a great mustache and does a lot of training, a lot of uh, unique things with guys looking to go to the, N- the NFL. Well, he is officially a consultant with BYU and leading up BYU sports science department alongside former BYU linebacker Colby Clawson. Those three gentlemen, the way I understand it and the way I envision it, are working together as a brain trust leading BYU strength and conditioning. So they may not have made a formal announcement, and we'll probably get a chance maybe the first or second day of spring ball to talk to Kalani Satake, and he'll be able to explain it more in depth. I, I'll actually, I'm going to plan to ask that and get it on the record from him about what's going on. But the way I understand it is those three gentlemen, Spencer Reed, Dr. Skyler Main, and Colby Clausen, they are kind of the triumvirate who are running BYU strength and conditioning, and they're, they kind of revamp things. They're looking more sp- uh, position specific. It's not squats every day like it was. It's not all these Olympic lifts. It's it's more dynamic and trying to uh, get things to more of an individual level for each one of these players. And the nice part is the early returns, based on what I've heard out of BYU, it's not been a ton, but guys are enjoying the th- way things are going with BYU strength and conditioning right now. All right, a couple other notes before we move on uh, today. Uh, BYU was supposed to take on UVU in Orem at uh, uh, Brent Brown Bar Park. Due to inclement weather in the area, obviously all the snow, et cetera, They have canceled that game. The game has not been uh, rescheduled. We'll find out uh, if that gets rescheduled. They are scheduled between to have two more games between the Wolverines and BYU this season. BYU is scheduled to open a three-game series on Thursday against Omaha at Miller Park. We're going to find out. Game times are set for 3 o'clock both uh, Thursday and Friday with the Saturday game slated for noon. Hopefully the weather holds out and the snow stays away. The nice part is BYU's turf field can melt snow and be able to make it so they can play. Might be just a little bit cold. You might want to bundle up if you're going to go out and watch BYU this coming weekend. Also, congratulations to BYU women's star Lauren Gustin. BYU women's basketball lost to the Portland Pilots 61-49 to Monday afternoon at the Marriott Center in their final regular season game of the West Coast Conference. Uh, BYU, similar to uh, BYU men, the BYU women, similar to the BYU men's basketball program, will be the fifth seed in the upcoming West Coast Conference Tournament. Both uh, women's and men's Cougars teams will be playing on Friday in the WCC Tournament down there in Las Vegas. But Lauren Gustin, as I mentioned, she broke the BYU single-season rebounding record late in the first half, passing BYU Hall of Famer Tina Gunn-Robinson's mark of 462 rebounds. Gustin finished with 24 rebounds on the night to also tie the Marriott Center record for the second time this year. She ends the regular season with 478 rebounds heading into the league tournament. She could go over 500 rebounds this season alone if they have a nice little run here in the West Coast Conference Tournament. So congratulations to her. Tough loss for BYU, but still cannot ignore what Lauren Gustin is doing for BYU women's basketball. All right, final thing before we go on today's show, we continue to look back at all 155 games of BYU's independent era. And today's game is one of the more memorable ones from the early uh, run of BYU's independent era. And the reason why is because it was Taysom Hill, seemingly at the peak of his powers, but also a guy who was giving as much as he was taking away in some ways. BYU went to Houston to play a game against the Houston Cougars, and Houston was lights out. BYU is 4-2 and two coming into this game. Houston was 5-0, and and this was just a big, big game down there in Houston, Texas. Taysom Hill came in and absolutely outdueled John O'Corn, who was the Houston Cougars quarterback in that game. Greg Ward also played a little bit uh, for, the, for the Houston Cougars in this matchup, but they were no match for what Taysom Hill was doing. Taysom Hill completed 29 of 44 passes for 417 yards. He had four touchdowns, but also three interceptions. He was absolutely up and down in this game, but phenomenal all the same. 
417 yards of passing is a great number. When you combine that with 128 yards rushing, well, you go over 500 plus yards. You put one on one of the finest performances of any individual player in BYU history. And that's exactly what Taysom Hill did. Cody Hoffman had, under, had 156 yards receiving. Skyler Ridley actually scored the go-ahead touchdown, ultimately let BYU prevail 47 to 46 in this shootout. Uh, in the final stanza of this game, he had eight receptions for 106 yards and a touchdown, maybe his finest game as a BYU Cougar. Ross Oppo had two touchdown receptions. Jamal Williams rushed for 83 yards and two touchdowns of his own. This was an absolute barn burning game. And any of you who watched this game or remember anything about it, you will remember this was kind of the game that Taysom Hill announced to the world that, oh, he can still run it. Obviously, he had dominated Texas earlier on in the 2013 season. But this showed that, hey, his passing coming around. I remember vividly thinking during this 2013 season, if Taysom Hill can get to a point where he is completing passes at the clip he's capable of showing in different games, it wasn't a consistent thing. And that's one thing we wanted to see from Taysom was the ability to consistently make passes and uh, you know, make passes, complete passes at a high level. Well, he did not do that uh, throughout his time at BYU, but the games like this against Houston, when he was at the peak of his powers, just a one man wrecking crew made you think, what could be for a guy like this? And who knows? Had those season ending injuries not uh, gone the way that they did outside of this season in 2013 for Taysom Hill, who knows what he could have become at BYU and potentially also in the NFL. He's had a great run, no doubt about it, in the NFL. He made $10 million last year, folks. There, He is making generational type money, being a do-it-all gadget player, just being the athlete that he is for the New Orleans Saints. And that's phenomenal stuff for him. But it's just it's crazy to think about some of these seminal performances he had for BYU during his career. It just makes you think, what could have been because Taysom Hill was an absolute freak lifted as much as many offensive linemen, if not more than his offensive linemen, his lower body strength in particular squats, power cleans, that type of stuff. There's the stuff of legend still to this day at BYU. He was just an absolute freak could run in the four fours could throw the ball a country mile. just absolutely insane. How much athleticism this guy had just, it just, it makes you think games like this against Houston, a 47 to 46, uh, a back and forth affair, a, a shootout. BYU gets the win to get to five and two on the season. And it just, like I said, it makes you think if Taysom Hill could have channeled more of this during his time at BYU and stayed healthy more consistently, it just, man, what, what might've been for the BYU football program. But nonetheless, that's why we talk about it. And hindsight, of course, is 2020. All right, that's going to do it for today's show. A huge thank you once again for making us your first listen of the day. You guys are great out there. Cannot thank you guys enough for your support. Tomorrow, new month. March is here. We'll continue to look at uh, some of our burning questions leading up to BYU spring ball. Also, need to talk a little bit about BYU athletes in the combine. Three of them, Jaron Hall, Blake Freeland, and Puka Nakua, headed to Indianapolis for the underwear Olympics, as some call it. Interesting stuff, and we'll talk about that as the week progresses as well. But stick with us all week long. We'll continue to have you covered on all things BYU. Now I want to encourage you guys to make your second listen, our friends over at the Locked On Big 12 podcast. Get caught up on everything with the Big 12 conference, hoops, football, and beyond with Josh Neighbors. Get that free and available wherever you get your podcasts. It's also available on YouTube. So until tomorrow, my friends, have a great rest of your day. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.